doing it are Get us in. We would be very interested. Yes, um, wants to sponsor us as a new class listed. Let's know. Yeah, so we have to say questions about homework one or two while we're here. Website at your convenience. I made comments on all your homeworks so you can see what I thought. I was very, very generous with the first homework assignment. If you did, attempted to do all of the sections you, and you handed it in on time, you got 10 out of 10. Um, the only reason I took away Mars is it just so, uh, or it was late. Um, a few things I want to point out about the homeworks. Uh, I will post my own solution, but I won't do it until because obviously homeworks will still be accepted up until Thursday for those who have not submitted one yet. Um, a few notes for others. First, don't put spaces in your file names. Please don't for Unix people. And we um, second, um, for your Git log commits, your Git commits that are in your log. A lot of you did, I've got a file, I'm done with it, now I'm going to commit it. Oh, we're going to, oh, you want to listen? Okay. So more suggestions about homework number one. So um, a lot of you for your git commits, you did, I'm done with my file, now I'm going to commit it to my repository. I'm done with file two, I'm committing that to my repository. A preferable way to do this is as soon as you create that file, an empty file, commit it. And then as you develop your code, as you're developing your functions, as you're debugging your functions, commit, commit, commit as you go. As opposed to, I'm going to develop the entire package, now I'm going to commit it. It's much better to develop as you go and then test so you can run back, roll backwards if you need to. Obviously, for these small scale assignments, this is less of an issue. But when you get to 10,000 lines of code, this will be much more helpful, I promise. The third thing, and more, most important, well, two parts. First, separate your testing code from the code that we asked for. Don't put the testing code into the files that contain the code itself. It's preferable to have, here's my code, here's my testing code in a separate file. And then in your testing code file, you put a source, my code over here source that file and that way you can import these functions and test them inside your testing routine and now the reason i say that is because a lot of you cut and pasted your code from part two into part three and that's exactly what we don't want you to do we don't want you cutting and pasting code you write a function you know it works you keep one copy of it forever and ever and then whenever you need it you just source that file and immediately that code will appear in the file you need it. So for part three, what we were looking for was source the file from part two and then run it. Okay, like I said, I was lenient. I didn't take marks off for this, but you'll see comments like that on the education website. So please go back and read it. If any of the comments don't make sense, email us, talk to us, whatever. I'm happy to go over it with you, okay? Um, and those of you that have not submitted your assignments yet and still wish to, you may. Obviously, we're still losing half a point per day, but assignments will be accepted until Thursday. Questions? Good. All right. You're on. So any questions from last week class no 
So, okay. So last week we. Um, so last week we start to see some statistics in R, uh, some functionalities that R provides. We are going to continue today and next class seeing some more statistics. Uh, the idea for today is to finish with uh, the basic review and some of the functionalities that you can use from R. And next class, I will try to focus in a statistical test, um, some more generalized models, uh, and hypothesis testing. Okay. So uh, last week, we, we reviewed the basic functions that R provides for doing some basic statistics like uh, computing the expected value, computing the standard deviation, um, using uh, already predefined uh, probability distributions. So now what I want to start today is uh, with some nice features that R has. It's called the apply functions. The apply functions can be used in general for any particular problem that you want to tackle, but we are going to still uh, stick with the statistics part. But Keep in mind that any of these functions can be used for, for any other function, functions that you create or, or, or you can use in other uh, contexts that is not just statistics. Um, what this set of functions, I, I, I call it star apply because you will see they vary uh, in the first letter in the name, like L apply, S apply, apply, T apply, or M apply. Uh, what they do is they apply one function to many different elements at the same time. Okay? In the same way that Eric showed us last week, uh, you can do a slicing and operate on vectors by doing a slicing and recover some results from the slicing and then apply that slicing to the same vector and that way be very efficient in processing that vector itself. The same way will work the, the apply function. So in that way, it's in the same spirit of the slicing mechanism. Um, so, the L apply function applies the function that we are going to, to define to each of the elements in a list or vector. The S apply is very similar to the L apply, but it also simplifies the output by returning a vector if it is possible. We are going to see examples of each of them. Um, the apply function is more used when you have matrices, either rows and columns, so you can define where do you want to apply the function, to the rows, to the columns, or to the whole matrix. Uh, the T apply apply the functions in a similar fashion, but a sub, to a subset or sublist or vector. Um, and then apply is a bit more uh, sophisticated. It just applies the transpose, the transpose of a list. Um, so let me let me show you some examples. So I think it's going to clarify. Um, so as I say, we are going to use the apply functions in the statistic context. So we are going, for instance, to use the L apply function to show that, assuming that you have a distribution, a probability distribution that is symmetric, which is centered at zero, uh, as the Gaussian distribution, if you, if you sample um, a large number of, of random numbers provided by, or by that distribution, the mean of that distribution should go to zero. Okay, And the reason is, is the shape of the distribution. So if it is the Gaussian distribution and it is centered at zero, and you start to take samples randomly at some point, if I get an enough number of points and I average between them, the average, the mean, should go to zero because the distribution is defined at zero. Okay? Talking about that, something that I want to clarify from the, from the second assignment. When we mentioned that numbers are drawn from a distribution, it doesn't mean that you are looking. So remember, this is, um, if this is the probability, this is the density function row. And the values that you are getting uh, from the density from the density distribution function are those values. But when you sample the function, what we meant with drawn numbers is the random number generation. Is that clear for everyone? I'm talking in particular about the second assignment, the second part, I think, for the first one. Yeah. So wait. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I think so. The the end. I don't remember the numbers. One was like hundred thousand something like that. 
and the other 500,000. So basically what I'm asking here is to generate random numbers, 100,000 random numbers, following either the, the Gaussian distribution or the Poisson distribution. Okay, is that clear for everyone? You're going to have to do it for the, for the assignment, so. Okay, yeah, no? I don't see you, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, let me know. It's very similar to this example, that's why I, I bring it now, okay? So in this case, I want, to, I want to show that as I increase the sample of numbers, I, as I increase n, the mean of the, of, this, of the samples is going to go to zero. Okay, so for doing that, I'm going to define a function that actually use two statistical functions within. I'm going to define the mean, mean dot n r norm. Basically, yeah, I'm not very good with names. So that function computes the expected value or the mean value of a random number uh, genera generation produced from a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, okay? And it takes as an argument n, basically the number of, of samples, random samples that I want to generate. Because I want to show you how to, how to use a apply, I'm going to generate a vector with different samples, with different size samples. So now my, what I call it, my number of samples, ns, we have one sample, 10 samples, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. Okay, so that's what I'm defining there, ns. Okay, so now I can basically take these vectors, which are the size of the samples I want to generate, and apply the function that I defined at the beginning. By doing so, what I'm computing is the expected value of a certain given size of random numbers that are generated from a, random, from a normal distribution. That's why it's because I'm using the R norm distribution. I could use the R Poisson distribution. It will be the distribution from a Poisson um, punch. Okay? So basically what I do is I take L apply, I choose my vector that defines the sizes of the samples, and I apply the function. Okay? And what L apply returns is basically the mean of each of the samples. So I'm doing two steps at once. I'm generating random samples of size 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000, and I'm computing the mean of those numbers. Is that clear? Yeah. And you can see that actually it's true. As you increase the number, the mean goes to closer to zero. And you can keep increasing. You can put like a million and, and, and see which is the trend. You can even plot these numbers and see that it tends to zero. OK, any questions? Um, I could have done this in two steps if you want. Again, I'm defining the, the vector with the sample size, ns, okay? And I'm defining now one function that computes uh, the random numbers. So basically, I'm taking ns, the vector with the sizes, and I'm applying just r norm, which is the function already defined in r, okay? Actually, you, what you can try to do, if, if you follow these steps, you can try to type what random nums has after the, that step. And you will see that you have vectors with these corresponding sizes, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000, 10, 10, uh, with random numbers uh, drawn from that distribution. And then I can apply again uh, now the mean. So it's the same. Basically, it should be the same result as before. And now I'm doing in two steps. Instead of defining my function, which call, was called means.n.random, I'm using the functions provided by r, r norm, r mean. Okay? And after I'm assigning the result to means, and then you, you see the trend is the same. The numbers are not exactly the same because they are random numbers that are drawn from, from the distribution. But the trend is very simple. Okay? Any questions? No? All right. So that was L apply. So basically, L apply uh, takes a vector, or it can be a list or whatever, and a function, and applies the function to each of the elements in that vector array or list. Okay? S apply does the same thing, but the difference is that 
when it's possible, it tries to simplify the output. As you were seeing before, means is a list, right? This notation means that this is a list. The disadvantage of list, or what? Well, this has advantage and disadvantage versus vectors. One of the advantages is that you can put whatever thing you want in a list, different types. But the advantage, the disadvantage is that by doing so, you cannot operate arithmetically on them. But if you get a vector instead, you can do mathematical operations on the vector. Okay, so I'm going to do the same. I'm still defining my sample size vector, NS, with one, ten, hundred, thousand, 1,000, and 100,000 samples. I'm defining uh, a variable now, a list of applying L apply, as in the previous case, so random nums produced by L apply to the, to the sample size vector by the random number generator. And now instead of applying L apply again, so that's the different part with, with the previous slide, I'm going to use S apply, okay? A simplified version of apply. And I assign in the result to means. Okay, so now I, when I type means, I get a, a vector instead of a list. Okay, by doing so, now I can operate, I can compute like means square, and I get results with numbers. So, if you need to operate in your result, or you need that as an intermediate step, it's always uh, better to use S apply instead of L apply. It depends also on the problem in particular, but if it is possible and you know that the result is all of the same type, then you can use S, S apply instead of L, L apply. Okay, any questions? We good? Okay. Um, this is a, a technical point, but uh, one thing that you can do in, in order to improve your performance, uh, is if you know the size in advance uh, that S apply will return, you can create a vector or a matrix, depending on, on which is the result, and use B apply instead. Um, so that, that will improve the performance. Especially, this is especially uh, to take in consideration if you are dealing with big data, with, with large amounts of data, uh, large vectors, and if you are constrained by memory. Okay? So just keep that in mind that instead of using S apply, you could you could use B apply, right? Um, okay, let's take a look at apply. So apply is used for matrices and, and arrays. So I'm going to define a matrix uh, with nine elements that goes from one to nine with three columns and three rows. So it's a square matrix, three by three. Okay, by typing that, you get the, the numbers there. So it's filling, um, recall I think Eric uh, reviewed this last week, uh, at this row major, so it's going to start to fill by rows. So it starts one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, by column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so that's the matrix. Now, let's say I want to compute a function uh, in each of the rows or each of the columns, okay? Uh, so the way that, uh, Apply does that is by defining either margin equal one for applying to the rows or margin equal two for applying to the columns. Okay, so let's say I want just to compute the maximum of each row. So I say apply to the object, the matrix A in this case. I'm saying that I want to apply per row, so margin equal one, and then the function I want to apply. In this case, I want just to compute the maximum. Okay, so I compute the maximum and you see. Uh, row one is seven, row two, eight, and row nine, is, uh, row three is nine. Okay, so I'm getting the maximum of each of the rows. Okay, if I, instead of doing that, I do apply with margin equal two, and again, the maximum, I'm going to get the maximum per column. So in column one is three, column two is six, column three is nine. Right? So it's the same idea as before. You take an object, in this case, it's a matrix, you're applying a function, and you need, because the matrix has two, two, basically two ways to choose the elements, per row or per column, you need to specify in which direction you, you want to apply, okay? Of course, you can apply to the whole matrix, okay? So for doing so, you apply uh, margin equal one, column two, okay? So let's say, um, again, I define the matrix again, say matrix as before, and now I apply a function, which I'm defining, in this case is take, 
x squared. So basically, each of the elements of the matrix and uh, the square of that element. OK? So I take the, apply again the matrix. I want to apply to each of the elements, so to the whole matrix. And then <laughs> I, I say margin equal 1, colon 2, and then the function I want to apply. In this case, I'm defining the function squared. So it's function of x, x squared. I'm defining on the same line the function. And then you can see that each of the elements instead, now is instead the square of the previous element. OK? Yeah, any questions? No? no. Um, so the last one I think we're going to see today is T apply, uh, which applies the same concept as before, but to a series of, of values or subsets. Um, in this case, we are going to use a data frame. Uh, remember, the, uh, R provides already some predefined samples of data for you. In this case, I'm going to choose the data set called Marley, which stands for the michelson morley uh, experiment. It's an experiment where physicists try to measure the speed of light in vacuum. Okay, so basically, what this is, is you type this is available for you in R, but if you type Data equal Morley, it will, it will load in data, the, the data samples from, from, from Michael's and Morley experiment. If you look at the structure, uh, that's another command that we saw last week. If you look at the structure of data, it's telling you it's a data frame. It contains 100 observations of three different variables. And actually, let me explain you a bit the, the, uh, the variables. They are not variables per se. The first field is uh, the experiment. So there are, I think, five different experiments that were run. And in each of the experiments, there were like, uh, I remember, like 30 runs. So there were a set of five experiments and 30 runs per experiment. And then there are the measures itself. So that's the speed of light. I don't know in which units, but the speed of light in certain units. So the experiments are, as I say, split in five different experiments and with different runs within the experiment. OK? And this is all. Uh, contained in, the, in a data frame structure, right? So let's say I want to compute um, like the mean, the average of the, of the results of this experiment, okay? So how I do that? Okay, I had T apply. Now T apply applies the function I want to apply to the data set, to the objects I want to specify by the subset I want to specify. So I want to apply, in this case, the mean function to the experimental data produced by data frame speed uh, defined in the subsets data experiment. Okay, so by taking the experiment, as I say, there are five. So experiment is not shown there, but if you look at experiment, there are one, two, three, four, and five. And then there are different runs within each of the experiments. And then different measures for the speed of light within these experiments, OK? So by doing t apply in the speed, which is the value that we are measuring, uh, identified by the experiment number, what basically we obtain is for each of the experiments an average, OK? So that's the average of the, of the speed of light measured in each of the sets of the experiments, OK? Uh, you can get similar results by using the split function. Basically, splits will divide the data in, in vectors that are grouped by uh, the key that you are giving. In this case, is the data frame and the key. Okay, so it will be uh, as, a, as before: data uh, dollar speed, comma data dollar experiment. Okay. Any questions? Yep. It means that they put together first the first uh, sets of experiments. So as I say, let's say that this is done per, per week. So the first week, they did 10 runs of the experiment. So they identified the first week with, uh, with the first uh, measures of the speed of light. So, or, so, so it's, uh, it's not an end. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I try to say here. So now in the screen is because it's too large. It's just showing uh, the first sets, 
but there is a one experiment number one and then experiment number two and experiment number three. A more realistic example may be that you, for mission the speed of flight, they basically set up a laser configuration. So maybe in experiment one, they use one configuration for mission in the experiment two, they use a different configuration. So they were switching the configurations or something. So that's why they identify. Uh, you, you can say that, yeah. It's, it basically, what they define is which is the variable which I want to compute the function I'm passing, and which is the subset which I'm going to group those values by. Okay, so let's say, I mean, maybe if I try to write this more explicitly, it will be clear. Just with a few examples. So this is experiment number. One, 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 two, two, three, three. This is the run number, which in this case doesn't matter much. And this is the speed value. Okay, let's say this is 700, 800, 850, 900, 910, 1,000, and 700. So basically what the function is going to do is it's going to look at this field it's going to split all the ones, all the twos, all the threes, and it's going to compute the mean on these numbers that are associated with the number of experiments. Okay. Yep. So I, I have a question yep. um, relating to assignment two. Obviously, this is a method. Is it, um, is it wrong for us to use a different subset? It's less efficient. No, 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 not at all. Actually, for when we, we brought the assignment two, we were even thinking in using this. So you can use whatever you want. Yeah, it's, not, it's not mandatory to use this at all. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So let me show you another example of uh, now. Uh, some of you will get more familiar with this. It's, it's another data set provided in R. It's a DNA data set of um, essays of uh, recombinant proteins. Don't ask me much about this because I have no clue what this is so far. Um, the only thing I know is, again, the, the data structure DNA is, uh, has a set of, of uh, runs, a concentration, and the density of the protein. Okay. So if you, if you just type for, for knowing what is there, you will see, again, there is a, a, a number of run, uh, the concentration of the protein, and the density of the protein they measure. Okay. Um, so what can we try to compute? Well, we, we, try to comp we can compute the same thing as before. Uh, now let's try to see. So the density is the optical density. So it's measured with a laser, probably, or light, or something. Uh, and the protein concentration. And we can compute the, the expected value and the standard deviation, okay? So I'm going to use, again, because this is a data frame, uh, it's very convenient to use pApply because it will allow me to create these subsets again, okay? So in this case, I'm going to compute the mean of the density and now specify by concentration, okay? So they, they have the concentration under control, so that's the, the variable that they, they change or to run in the experiment. So they change the concentration, so I can compute which is um, the density, the, the average density. Okay, so I can do that. They had, I think, 10 different concentrations. Um, and then the other thing that we can compute is the standard deviation. Okay, so in that case, it's just reduced to just one line, uh, even when, it's, when, when this is located in a, in a data frame, it's very easy to compute things on top of that. Okay, it's a very similar example to the previous one. All right, any questions? Trying to include as much examples as I, as I can so you can feel that it's more common to certain areas than, or fields than others, so. Okay. Okay, so let's switch gears now and start to, code, to talk about um, Modeling or fitting or linear regression, you may find different names depending on the, on the field that you are working. Um, the point is that uh, sometimes when you are measuring data, um, 
you need to come with the idea of what if there is a law underlying the data that you are collecting or there is a relation between the data that you are observing. So the way that usually works is you, you start by collecting data, uh, you assume or propose certain relationships. Uh, this is, as, as I say, they, this may depend on the field where you're working, but sometimes it's called model, sometimes it's called a law, sometimes it's called a relationship uh, between the variables that may be involved in the data that you are observing. So that's that function x of i, uh, uh, sorry, f of x and i. Uh, you try to do the fitting or apply your model. Again, these are same things, but depending on the field, it's called in different manners. And then, this is important, after doing the fitting, you need to test or evaluate uh, which is the result, if the fitting is appropriate or not. Okay? So what you're going to discuss today uh, in this section is, is a particular case, the simple case, where you're going to fit, where we're going to fit a, a very simple linear model. Okay? And as I say, this is called differently depending on which field you are working. Okay? Is everyone familiar with this sort of techniques? Yeah? Okay. So let's start with the simplest one. Let's consider then the, the simplest possible case, which is a linear model. Basically, I had an observation, which I measure, and I think that that observation may depend on some factors. And I'm going to uh, ask me that you forgive me because I'm going to use very simple examples that are maybe oversimplified for sure. Um, but this just to give you a, a flavor, an idea of, of what is going on. Okay? So basically, the, the variable that you are measuring or you are observing can be y, and then the relation can be with certain thing that affects that variable, let's call it x, something that also changed. And A and B are parameters that we are going to try to identify, to know, to, to uh, fit with the model. Okay? If one wants to be more precise, sometimes what people include with that delta function at the end is noise. Either noise that can represent uh, uncertainty in the observations or uncertainty in the model, meaning things that we don't know or we are not including in them. Okay? So, the example I, I, I came with because there is a data set in R that provides this, this kind of data is okay, I'm going to assume that somehow <coughs> I can measure the rate of growth of a plant, in a particular a cherry black, a black cherry tree. Um, and I'm going to say, because I'm a physicist, and you may have heard that for physicists, a cow is just a sphere of negligible mass. So I can do that. Um, I'm going to assume that the growth, the, the growth rate of the plant is just depend on the water, on the temperature, maybe on the fertilizer that you use, and the insects that are present in the, in the ecosystem where the plants live. Okay? As I say, this may be a very raw, a very um, uh, simplified version, but this is just my starting point. I, I should, from the data, also know if this model is good or not. And that's something that we're going to see today. Too. Okay? So, as I say, R provides a, a data set, which is called trees. Um, basically, trees is uh, the data of the girth, which is, I think, is the diameter of the, of the trunk of the tree, uh, the height of the tree, and the volume. Okay? And something that it's always a very good idea to do when you get data either from experiments or for previous results or for wherever, is to try to look at the data and see what you can see in the data. If there is some sort of information in the data present that could give you some clues of what to do with it, okay? So this is the first time we're going to see some plots in the course, but if you just take the data frame trees and you apply plot to trees, it's going to produce this plot in the right corner, okay? So basically what R is doing is plotting all the variables against each other. So it's plotting the girls versus uh, the height and the girls versus the volume and all the possible combinations, okay? So just by looking at that, what you can see is, okay, some of the variables, they don't show any kind of simple relation at the very first glance, but you notice that the, the very uh, high and lower uh, plots they may have some time linear relation between them, okay? Or they may lie between a, in a line. So I'm, I'm plotting again. Now I'm, I'm choosing the girth and the volume, and I'm plotting that relation, and it may lie in a line, okay? 
So from the data set, I think uh, you can try with other ones, but I think that uh, those variables, if any of those, may be the ones that present a linear relation between them, okay? When I say a linear relation, if you, if you want just imagine that I can draw a line and the points are going to lie very close to the line that I draw, okay? So let's try to see if that is possible, okay? So the way that you can do linear modeling in, in R or, or modeling in general, we will see, is by using the command LM. It stands for linear model, okay? We're going to see that by doing some tricks, we can actually fit more general models. And R also provides a generalized linear model that shouldn't become uh, confused with a general linear model, okay? So we're going to discuss that too. Um, the way that it works is very simple. You put LM, you open the parentheses and it's a function, so you need to provide information. And the information that you provide is the variable I want to fit, and then tilde, the variable that I think it depends on. Okay? So in this case, I'm fitting the volume versus the girth. Okay? What R returns by doing so is telling me, okay, you call the linear model using this formula. Uh, if you want to read, it's like volume tilde girth. I'm, I'm omitting the trees and the dollar. And then it's returning me the coefficients, okay? Because it's assuming that I want to fit this with a linear model, so it's a line. Uh, it's telling me, okay, that model intersects the y-axis at minus 36.943, and uh, the slope, that's the slope, is 5.066, okay? So basically what, what this information is telling me is the volume, can be represented in terms of the girth of the tree by this equation. And notice I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's approximately equal, uh, just by considering that this can have noise and, and there may be other terms that are affecting this relation. Okay? This clear? So it's very simple just to compute a linear model given that I had the right data. Okay? Um, just a uh, a thing about notation, if you want to write uh, just directly the variables instead of, of specifying that this comes from the data frame, you can use LM, volume, uh, tilde, girth, and the data is provided by the trees data frame, okay? We haven't seen that yet. Some people use it, I, I'm not a fan of that, but you can use also the command attach. By using attach, if, for instance, I do attach trees, then I can just refer to the variables within that data frame. And then you can de-attach. The trouble with that is if you forget that you attach something and you have variables in different data frames that are calling the same way, then you may screw things up. So that's why I don't prefer it, but it's there if you want to use. Okay? Okay, so that is uh, our linear model, how we compute the linear model. Um, the other thing to take in consideration is we saw what LM returns in the screen, but we can assign, because it's a function, in R everything is a function, uh, LM returns a type, which is a linear model type. So I can assign the returning uh, object to a new variable called M that is going to be a linear type. If I do that, there is nothing in the screen, but then I can type just M and it will print the information from the model, okay? Even more, there are many things that you can do. You can use a structure, you can do um, summary, as we did before, of the model, and you will have more information. In particular, something very useful is if you do that assignment of the model to a new object, then you can ask for the coefficients. And why? You say, okay, the, the coefficients were already printed in the screen, right? But by doing so, then now I can access those values per se and start to evaluate, to evaluate the model. So I can start to predict which will be the volume of a tree that has a given uh, girth, okay? So now I can ask the question of, okay, which will be um, the volume that this model is going to predict for a, a tree that has a girth of 15.12 in whatever units that we're measuring, okay? And basically what I'm doing is, for computing that, I'm taking the coefficients, and I'm using this operator. This operator, I think, uh, Eric mentioned it when, when he was uh, talking about matrices. You can think about this operator as uh, the dot product. If you, if you know what the dot product is, it's basically 
it, it works for matrices or vectors. And basically what it does is if you had two vectors, it computes the inner product or the dot product. Let's say this has elements B1, B2, B3. This one has elements uh, W1, W2, W3. Basically it's going to do this. B1 times omega 1 plus B2 times omega 2 plus B3 times omega 3. So it returns you a number. Either when you take matrices or, or vectors, it returns you a number. Okay? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm taking the coefficients and I multiply it by a vector that has first element 1, I'm going to tell you why, and the second element, the girls I want to evaluate. Why is that? Because the coefficients can be seen as a vector. So the coefficients, if you want, is a vector that contains uh, the independent term. In this case, is what we call B, and the, the slope term. Okay. If now I define a vector with one and 15.12, and, and I do the dot product, I get B times 1 plus A times 15.12, which is the same of evaluating the equation that was defined by the model before. Okay, Something neat that you can try is also to compute coefficients dot product C10 and C01. Okay? What these things will return is uh, the intercepting value of the model and the slope of the model. Okay? Just by doing that operation over there. Right? Yes? No? Okay. So just one line and you can actually fit a model in there. Um, as I said, you can ask for the summary of the model, and it will give you tons of information as usual. It will give you not only the formula that you use for fitting the model, um, it will give you, which is the residuals. We're going to talk uh, more in detail about this probably next week, next class, sorry. Um, standard errors, t-values, all kind of things. The p-value, the degrees of freedom that was in that data, uh, all kind of statistical estimators. Okay? So a, by doing the assignation of the model, of the result to the model to the variable, to a variable, uh, it will allow you to access a lot of more statistical information. Okay? So let's try to see how the model does with the data. All right? So let's try to basically plot the data. So the first line, uh, plot trees, dollar girls, trees, uh, dollar volume, it's basically plotting the data, the experimental data that was available in the data frame. Okay? You will see, and, and I'm not specifying anything, so by default, R is going to plot just uh, empty circles there, or empty dots. Okay? Then, by just doing A, B line and the model, it's going to add the line that the model is going to predict. Okay? If you want to try it now, try it. This is, this is a good idea. You will see that. It's, the data is available for you in R, so it should be pretty straightforward. So the model is not bad, right? It goes through many of the points. But as you can see, there are some outliers, especially in the bottom and in the top, right? Some dots that are not completely covered or that they are farther away. And actually, I, I, I bet you that if you compute the standard deviation there, you will see that the residuals are not homogeneously or, run or uniformly distributed. Okay? So that is one of the indications that the model is good, but maybe it's not so good. At the end, if it is good or not, it may depend on what you want to do with the model. If your range of interest is just in the middle, you may be happy with that. If you want to see for a very large tree, that model may be not good enough. Okay? So, Let's try to see if we can catch those outliers by a new model, okay? So we are going to propose a model now that is, I, I'm going to call quadratic, and I, I, I'll say again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm already corrupted by physics, so I'm going to, trash us, going to just try to take the girls, use the square of the value, and propose a relation like this, that the volume depends of a coefficient that the model is going to give me, 
the coefficient is a, a girth square plus another coefficient times the girth plus a, a constant. Okay, it's the second step, basically. And again, if you if you have, if you have more knowledge of the system, you can put more variables. You can make the model more accurate according to how you know the model. I don't know anything about trees, so I just came with this. Okay. Okay. So how I do this now? Okay, we saw before how to do uh, the linear fitting of the model. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a linear fitting now, but I'm going to cheat now. I'm going to put a variable that is the square. Okay, so a simple way to do that, and using the same technique, is to compute now what I call girls two, which is basically the square of the values of the girls in the in the tree of the in the data of the tree. Okay, and now I'm going to compute a model that I call M two, which is one for quadratic model which basically is going to approximate the volume of the tree with the girls plus the girls square. So I'm adding a new term, this girls two, which is nothing else than the square of the value of the girls for each of the trees. Okay, is that clear? So basically the only thing that I change is I add a new term. I add the term girls two, which is the square of the girls. Okay? I'm using the different notation now just to avoid writing $3 every time. So I'm saying that the data comes from the data frame called tree. Trees. Okay. And I get the model in, in the variable M2. Okay. If I, if I, so I, I did that in R. Now I'm typing, uh, typing coefficients of M2. So I want to know which were the values that the model is returning. And now it's telling me, okay, the, the line, the model actually, now, as you can see, this is going to be a parabola. It's a quadratic model. It's a, it's a dependence square in the x variable. Um, intercepts in 10.78, blah, blah, blah. The coefficient in front of the linear term is minus 2.09 something. And the term in, uh, in front of the quadratic term is 0 0.25 or something. Okay. So I want to see how well the model does. And for doing so, I, I just plot the model. Okay, and now you can see this is the linear model, the straight line in black, and the red line is the quadratic model. So that model clearly uh, captures more the behaviors of the of stream values of the of the girth. Right, it's closer to these outliners, closer to that point over there. Okay, so just by increasing um, a bit the complexity of the model in this case. It looks like the fit is, is more accurate. Okay. So, okay, this is basically the same thing. Um, oh, one more thing. If you want actually to get, so if you plot M2, it's going to show you a lot of information of the model. It's not going to show you the red line per se. It's going to show you the residuals. It's going to show you in a graphical manner all the uh, statistical estimators of the model. Which is a good idea to do, by the way. I, I didn't include here in the slide because I didn't want to um, overpopulate the slide, but we are going to see that also later. Uh, if you want to add that red line, what you have to do is the following. You need to create, I think this is also, also a good idea to, to see so you can start to play with, with uh, more complex models. So you need to create two vectors. One I call XX is a vector that basically generates a sequence between the minimal value of the girls. So it's starting in mean trees girls, basically this value, and it goes up to the maximum value here. And the length is the number of elements that the, that the data has, the number of points that, that is in the data. Okay? So I'm generating a sequence from the minimum to the maximum value of the girls with the same number of points that the, that the data has. The difference is not going to be exactly located where the data points are. I could use that if I want, but it's going to be uniform uh, located across the x-axis. Okay, so that's the first vector I create. The second vector is nothing else than evaluating these new points with the new model. So for doing that, basically I took the coefficients given by M2. This is another way of calling coef of M2. Because M2 now is another option of R, I can do M2 dollar coefficients, apply the dot product uh, with a random sample generations of X. Okay, so I'm taking 
basically a random sample of points generated by X. And then the only thing I'm doing is just adding a new line with the values of X, Y. You can see that line is a bit uh, thicker than the previous one, so it has a, a width of two, and I'm choosing a color two, which represents red. You can choose three or four different values of the color, okay? Same thing you can, you can get by doing this. Is instead of doing, as I say, in this case, what you are going to get is the values at the start position of where the data lies. It's taking the trees volume data, so this should be trees girth, not volume. Uh, and it's going to evaluate the data in those exact points. Okay? The representation is going to be roughly the same. Okay? Any questions? So basically what we saw is how to fit a model now with a quadratic dependence. If I want a cubic dependence, instead of taking girth 2 equal to girth square, I take girth 3, for instance, equal to girth to the power of 3, or whatever dependence I think it may be uh, appropriate to fit. And then I, I just fit it with the linear model, um, that relation. And the others are just tricks to plot the new relation. Basically, you can just follow the steps, and it will give you should give you this this well should give you the plot of the new model that you are trying to fit to the data. Okay. Any questions? Is it more or less clear? Is it not clear at all? Uh, this one, this one or this one. So either that sequence from here to here, or either this sequence. The only difference between these two is this one is going to generate points uniform, uniform distribute across the x-axis. The sequence in the bottom is going to take the values of the x values of the data points, and it's going to evaluate the model there. Visually, there shouldn't be a lot of difference. You will see like the curve has some bumps here and there. But there shouldn't be much difference. Okay. Sorry again. It's not working. Well, the, the plus three and girls, oh, probably yes. So this is adding that line to that plot. So you, you need to do that plot first. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, sorry, my bad. Lines or AB line, as before, is basically adding a line to a plot. So, yeah. If you want to do it quickly, just do attach trees and plot girls and plot uh, comma volume, and that will produce the first plot. Yep. Is it acceptable because this is not a linear variable? That front one? Sorry, Evan, is? Is it for the non linear variable? Is that using a linear model? Is that front one? Or? I mean, R won't tell you if this is appropriate or not. R what will tell you is okay, you give me this model. You give me a model which is y equal. 8s squared plus px plus c, and I'm going to return you these values. That is all what R is going to do, plus some things. We are going to exactly tackle that question next class. Okay? It's just telling you these values. It's going to do whatever you want. Okay? You, instead of doing this, you can do something like um, something crazy. Okay? x plus b log of actual value of x, or something. I don't know, something completely random. R is going to try to fit that. Is that the right model for you or not? It may depend on your problem. It may depend on how good the fitting is. And it may depend on some other information that I'm going to start to cover now, which is related to, it's related to how the model fits, how the model fits the data, but how also the models respect the assumptions underlying those fits. 
the statistical assumptions that I talked at the last class. Like all this is based on, on certain statistical statistical laws. How good are those assumptions? Uh, how good those assumptions are for the model itself? Okay. So there is in statistics and in model fitting, there is not always the right answer probably is the most appropriate answer for whatever thing you want to want. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Mm -hmm. The YY is basically taking the coefficients of the model and doing the dot product with uh, now I have XX, so let me let me draw a picture. I always better, or at least I think I'm better at explaining things in the board. And um, these are my data points. Okay, so this is the minimum of the value in X. It's called X I, and this is X final. Okay, XX is going to have, and let's let's give these numbers. Let's call this one and ten. Uh, sorry. Two and eight, and I have four data points. Okay, xx is going to be a vector that has numbers like two, four, six, and eight, because I start in the minimum, I go to the maximum, and I want four elements there. Okay, so xx is this. My model is something like a x squared plus b x plus the independent coefficient. A, b, and c are provided by M2 dollar coefficient. Our bind is going to evaluate the values from xx to 4, 6, 8 in this way. The first is going to be always 1 because it's the one that is multiplying the independent coefficient. So yy is going to have this information. y1 is going to have 1 times the coefficient independent, the independent coefficient of the of the model, which I call C here, plus uh, the second coefficient, let's give name is P times XX plus C times XS squared. That's what our mind is doing here. It's generating a new vector that contains the value of one X xx and xx squared and then the um, dot product operator is just multiplying the, the vector of the coefficients provided by the model with that new by that new vector that is generated is this this is just a way to do it the other way will be this one and this should be girls sorry this should be girls instead of volume okay Any questions? No? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it depends who you ask. If you ask a mathematician, this is still a one variable model. Uh, Somehow it's semantics. This is still one variable because the, the observation depends only on the girth. And basically what I take in is the girth square. It's like if I do a model with the log of the girth instead of the girth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Um, you can do that. Yeah. We are going to see something related to that, which is called generalized linear model. Um, so we are going to do that in that way. But you could do that here too. So it's a, it's a kind of variation of the linear model where you, basically you are adding one more degree of freedom. OK? Like I think there was the height there in the data. You could do that with the height too. OK? So, okay. okay, let's start very quickly with correlation. I think I have three slides. 
And this is mostly just a uh, review of definitions. So remember the first class, we, we, or last class, we, we reviewed some of the definitions. Um, one of the definitions we were interested in or we reviewed was the variance and the standard deviation. That's basically measure how dispersed is the data with respect to the expected value or the mean value of the data that I have. This is what the expected value of x minus, minus the expected value of x all square is giving me, or the standard deviation, which is the square root of that. When we have more than one variable, which is related to, to your question as well, um, the question is how I generalize that. Okay, I have a set of variables. I know how this, how, which is the expected value of that variable. I know how dispersed it is, but how can I generalize this to larger number of variables? And the way to do that is by defining what is called the covariance and the correlation between two variables. Okay, and this is nothing else, as I say, a generalization of the definition of variance and standard deviation. You can see. The covariance is nothing else than the expected value of one of the variables minus the expected value of that variable times the other variable minus the expected value of that other variable. Okay? The correlation is the same definition, but is normalized by the standard deviation of each of them. So it basically says, okay, I want just to know how these two variables are correlated, so I need to forget about the dispersion of each of the variables. It's normalizing on top of the standard deviation of each of the variables. Okay, one neat thing that you can check is if you compute uh, the covariance is equal to the standard deviation times, or the covariance, sorry, which is called, so called standard deviation for the two variables is equal to the correlation times the standard deviation of each of them. And something more neat is that if you compute the variance of one variable, it's just the standard deviation squared which is a definition that we took from the beginning, but actually now with these generalized formulas, you can prove that. Um, another thing that is important to consider is what is called the correlation coefficient. And in this case, I'm just writing the definition for a uh, discrete sets of measures or, or sets. And you can see it's, it's, it's a sum over the values of the variables, either x or y, minus the expected value of each of them, divided by basically the standard deviation or, or the correlation, the, uh, sorry, the covariance of the variables. This coefficient is, very, is going to be very important because it gives you a measure of how well related those variables are, okay? In particular, when we are doing linear fitting, that coefficient is going to tell you how is the relation between the variables. If the variables are related in a, um, in a uh, positive or negative manner. I mean, if it is between zero and one, then the relation is, is positive. So meaning that I increase one of the variables, the other variable will increase. If it is negative, it's going to say, okay, if one of the variable increases, the other one will decrease. Now, people use this coefficient a lot, especially when they do a statistical analysis. And the main goal is to keep that coefficient closer to one as possible, in absolute value if you want. Why is that? Because then it's saying that the relation between the points is almost linear and a linear fitting should work. Now, take a look at this plot here. This is called Ascombis Quartet. All these data sets, the four different data sets, has the same coefficient, 0.916, okay? Almost 0.82. Look at how they are distributed. One is a quadratic relation, this may be just a linear relation. This is all, almost all vertical points. My point here is you cannot only keep one statistical uh, estimator in mind when you are doing data analysis or data fitting because your points can be all kind of mess. And the estimator will, all, will give you basically the same answer. So always visualizing things is very useful. We're going to see other estimators as well. Okay, you can prove that. This is a very well-known example. All of them will show the same correlation. If you fit, we'll get always the same model, but they are all different. Okay. Um, okay, let's take the example. Um, we're almost finished. Let's take the example that we did the fitting um, over quadratic model, and let's compute the correlation and the covariance. And you can see the correlation. Uh, in that case, it's 0.97 almost. The covariance is almost 50. Um, 
we can compute also the variance of both the uh, data set combined or each of the variables per se. So again, that will give you an idea of how dispersed is the data compared to the mean value of the data. Uh, same thing for the standard deviation. And something that is very nice is I have been telling you about this relation between the standard deviation and the variance, that one should be the square root of the other one. Now you can try it and see if it is true. So if you write the square root of the variance of one of the variables and ask for if this equal, remember the equal sign means it's a question. Is this true? Uh, you will get in this case is true. Okay. Uh, one final comment is when you compute the correlation, and again, this uh, we're going to look more in detail next class, you have some data that you want to use, and then R is very good for handling data that is not complete, like the NAs, that is not available. In the same way, you can use these estimators, these statistical estimators with all the observations, just the complete observations, or the pairwise complete observations. Same thing. Uh, or, or you can also specify the method in which the correlation is computed using Pearson, Spearman, or Kendall. And these same options apply to the covariance as well. Okay. Um, you know, I'm almost done. So other correlations, estimators that you can use is, for instance, the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. That's the, uh, it's usually called core coef. It's the correlation coefficient that R that I told you. So now if you compute core.test uh, and with the, with, the, with the model that we compute, it will give you that the correlation coefficient is 0.97. However, we saw that the quadratic model may be better than this one. And I think this is all what I have for you today. There is other information I'm, I'm going to, to go through it uh, next class. Okay. Any questions? Um, Okay, okay. So if you have questions also about the, the homework, just uh, let us know as well. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so these two parts, is that this is the reverse version of this one. So like, you change x and y uh, before? Uh, no, what I did there is uh, you don't want to generate these x's. You can actually use, and this is, uh, this should be trees uh, instead of volume. Yeah, so you can actually use the trees and use the
on what you purchase. Oh, I just want to like, I, I just kind of remember this. Why? Oh, 
this is a part of the This is a part of the I'm basically talking about the way it is. And we are saying why using the bonus. Why are you using the bonus? So you can do the same. Once you're your data frame, you can use the data frame. You can use the data frame. That's where it must be high. And they can do all the things that you can there. So this is someone else's new project. Oh, yeah. So we have a bunch of directories where our project is based on our tribe's command, which are the class extensions. We can actually be able to show everything on the project. And if it is, then you just need to get log right there, and then it will be a faster. Uh, is it seven practice? That was a Yeah, yeah. Where else? The other option, of course, is just to run the command I don't Y 
Si te lo devuelvo como así dice, está bien. Ah, ¿sí? 